The mission that I write is to bring people together, all walks of life, no matter what color you are, no matter where you come from. I, 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 I try to bring people together to understand that we could live in this world together as one, and then we could share what we got in this beautiful earth of ours. Eh? And I feel in my music, like I could show how the Inuit lived a long time ago and share my songs with them and letting them know that we could work all together and to save this beautiful, beautiful earth that we got. <laughs> we want to like hold on. Okay. Ready? Ready? And Give us a countdown. Okay. And uh, two, three, two, one. Like when I was a kid in the Northwest Territories, uh, when I lived with my mom and dad, when I was, I, the funny thing, I remember when I was five years old, four years old, three, like, uh, like, like, like when we live in the wilderness, you know, with the log house and uh, uh, the log house, and we were living off the land, you know, and the town wasn't that far away. And as a child, the land was beautiful. Like I was so adapted to, to the weather. I was adapted to the storm, the summer, the winter, you know, and uh, the way my dad and mom live in the wilderness, I adapted so well that they taught me how to speak my language. They taught me a little bit how they hunt for the blue gohills, caribou, the wolves, you know, the rabbits, ptarmigans, and fishing and living off the land. and. And, and living in a condition of the 30 below, 40 below, you know, it was natural for us to live. You know, it, it, it was easy to go to the Aklavik by the McKenzie River, and our fish camp wasn't that far, you know, and uh, this is where my dad and mom spend their winters, you know, uh, since they left Husky Lake or since they left their work that they were doing. Uh, I lived up there with my mom and dad until I was about, uh, let's see, I, I left, uh, I went to residential school when I was five. And then uh, I started I start going to school 10 months out of the year from uh, 53 on until 60, 65, you know, then I go home to my mom and dad. But uh, at the early age, my mom and dad passed away maybe between 61 and 63. And, and then after that, our family, our family's life was shattered, like it was broken apart because the residential school took us away from our mom and dad, you know, and, and from there on, like, it, it, it was a life that was uh, beyond our control, you know, and we lived what came. We, we adapted what came. We accepted what came, and we went through a lot of difficult times ever since, ever since the massive change came from came to the north. I remember when I first left when I was five years old, my mom, my mom was carrying me 
not carrying me, walking me to the residential school. And I didn't know at the time that uh, walking towards the residential school and looking behind the Mackenzie River, that my life would change forever. I, I didn't know at the time that I'll never see, you know, the traditional ways my mom hunt with the caribou, with the beluga whales, how we live off the land, how to get the Arctic char and ptarmigans, live in the log house and living the most beautiful life in the wilderness, free, you know. While I was walking away at the time, I didn't know that this was going to be taken away from me forever. And then when I was five years old, um, when I walked to the residential school with my mom holding her hands, that was the biggest turning point of my life. I, I remember that I couldn't speak, I couldn't speak, uh, I couldn't speak uh, English, I remember. And, um, and, 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 and then I was condemned for speaking my language. I got strapped, put stand in the corner, I would, I, would get, uh, I would get into a lot of fights, beat up by a lot of students. And uh, it was really hard for a five years old to start a life that way, get, getting into fights with, with kids I don't even know and teaching us, uh, teaching us who, who was Jesus, who was, who was Christianity, what it was, and speaking the new language and saying this is the way it's going to be for you, Mr. Thrasher. You're, we're, we're going to take the uh, Inuit life out of you, and, and we're going to bring you back to Christ, where you really belong. You know, and, and that was their goal, you know, to take everything that my mom and dad lived for thousands of years, take it right out of us. Well, and in real life, later on in real life, we knew, it, I, we knew that uh, the prophet Jesus wouldn't do it that way. We knew that he wouldn't hate Inuit. He knew he wouldn't come them. It was the way that Rome, the head of the Catholic Church, put it, you know. And, and they went totally against uh, the law of Christ. And they, and, they, and, they, and, they, and they did it their own way. And, you know, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure if if Christ was with us today, he would have danced with us. He would have danced inuktitut with us, and accept our ways. You know, <laughs> you know, he would gladly dance with us. And uh, back home right now, it's uh, it's really bright. You know, and it's gorgeous up there, and I and I miss it very much. And uh, like uh, like when I wrote this song. Uh, it, it, it brought me much closer to where my home is and remembering my brothers and sisters and, 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 and how we lived so, so, so many years ago. And then this song here is uh, uh, the title of our CD in the back there and, uh, and it's called Assume Attack and it goes like this here. I met Willie by just, I would be walking down through the waterfront here in Nanaimo down in the harbor front and one day I just heard this person singing and when he would sing I could feel that real true love about his music that it was come from his soul, you know. It wasn't just 
old music that you can normally just listen to. And, was, and he had this really raw voice that really captured your ears when you'd hear it. Certain songs you'd really, just he'd draw you right in. And that's what really captured me to Love and Willie's music through the years. And still to this day, he'll come up with some kind of funny song and start singing. And another thing, what really I enjoyed about Willie is how he made people feel and the kids. He'd always welcome people. He was just wasn't a busker. He was actually a performer for the town in Nanaimo, an ambassador because he'd always welcome people from all different worlds, you know, and just people just love what he would say. Good afternoon, Vancouver. My name is Willie Thrasher and, and uh, we've been on the road here for a while. And this is my singing partner, Linda Sandback. And, 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 and our agent is doing all the promotion as Kevin Howard. He's in the back there. Give him a hand, Kevin. And uh, we'd like to dedicate this song to the First Nations that used to live in this area before Vancouver was born. And it's called Sanage. And uh, we got we got limited CDs in the back. Uh, those of you who want to support us on the road, L L Linda will be more than glad to show you. And here's one of the songs from our CD called Sanders. And thank you for coming. You will always be in our hearts forever. Here, the song goes like this. Yeah, I was in university. I'd be bored in between classes and I'd go to the, the SFU library and like go into the, there was a little record library and I'd listen to jazz records, Rashawn, uh, Roland Kirk, or like, you know, some avant-garde music. I'd put on the headphones and just like listen, sort of max out, or I'd go to the, the books, the book music section and I'd look up like, you know, try to find books about like, you know, punk artists from England, from two-tone ska things, like groups like the English Beat, and I just sort of like max out and use the photocopier, you know, and like, you can only do that for so long. In a lot of the cases, the artists who I've been working with, their stories weren't really told. They weren't featured, you know, in magazines and national magazines and on television and on radio. In a lot of cases, they were marginalized from that sort of, uh, you know, pop cultural world and the media world, the mass media world. In many cases, the re these are regional artists who played in their towns or communities, but weren't really known outside of that. But by a lot of per perseverance and and maybe a bit of luck and passion and money and everything, like some of these artists were able to record music on vinyl records and put them out and. In a lot of cases, some of these records didn't even sell well at the time. You know, they'd sell like a hundred copies and that was it, you know? And over the years, these records trickle out and they, people die, people move, they get rid of their possessions, they wind up at thrift stores and flea markets and used record stores. And that's where I go to find them. I wasn't a guitar player at the time. I didn't even know what was that. I thought, for me, it would be just like another stick you know, another piece of wood, you know, it's uh, another piece of wood. But, uh, but uh, when I was in the residential school, uh, 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 there was a set of drums in the gymnasium, you know. So I, I walk in the gymnasium and then I went to the locker room where they had the basketballs and everything in there. And then I looked in there and then I seen a set of drums, you know, and I looked at it. So I sat down, I looked at it and I started pounding it slowly. And they had a tom-tom and a snare, two sticks, you know, and then I, I started banging it every day. And then I liked it because I seen people doing country music. I seen people doing rock and roll, fiddle music, 
you know, I seen drummers, you know, and then, and then I got really excited, you know, I said, maybe I could learn this. Because I wanted to stay away from the kids, and there's too many of us in there, and I want to have time to myself. So every day I would go to the gymnasium, and I would bang on those drums every day, every day. Then we start getting better, start getting better, and I start getting the beat. Then I start seeing other musicians, like Ian Tyson came down, I seen a lot of big singers from the South came down to Newark to play, and I seen the drummers, I seen orchestras, I, I seen the drummers, and I really, I said, so that's the way they do it, you know? And then uh, at the time, Louis Goose was playing the guitar, he was sort of like country rock, you know? And I see him play guitar, and, and then he see me playing drums, you know? I said, hey, let's try this, you know? So we went to the gymnasium, and, and then Lawrence Thrash, he joined in, you know, and then uh, later on, uh, Jerome Tucker, and later on, uh, Moses Kalanick, and, and then we became the Cordells. We were known all over the, the territories as the band, the Collis, to play for their dances. So it was a big, big, big memories of my life, of how my music, my music career started. and. Uh, and uh, I remember the Cordells, I remember us being young and wild under the great northern lights, you know. I remember us playing all over, having fun, going on the plains and meeting people from di different communities and our band going nuts and wild, you know. We were, we, we took our frustrations out on the stage and people loved us, you know, so. And then meeting the old man, and, and then meeting the old man, uh, Meeting the old man from uh, uh, from Inuvik that night that we played for the Cordell uh, dance for the for the New Year's dance, an old man came up to us and and uh, and uh, and uh, he heard us play uh, uh, our good old rock and roll song and that old man said, "Why didn't you write your own traditional songs? Why didn't you write your songs about your people?" And you know what? I didn't even know nothing about my culture, nothing. And I look at that guy. He said, "Weird, you know, you're really weird guy." He said, "Holy!" And I asked him, uh, "What do you mean traditional music?" And he told me, "The way you lived long time ago, how you hunt polar bears and seals, how you built your igloos, who was the medicine man, how you live off the land, and all the stories that came with it." This old man knew so much about our culture. That night, that night I sat, we all sat down with him and, and, and he kind of woke me up. He kind of wondering, uh, wondering where I came from. I think that was the turning point of my life. I think that's what uh, started my music career, but I didn't know that at that point that that was going to be the turning point of my life. And that's how Eskimo Named Johnny came out uh, you know, with child, you know, spirit child, and all the songs that are coming out. Because uh, that old man talk about the Inuwaluis, and he, 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 uh, he brought back a lot of spirit that was taken away from me. Uh, I was controlled so much by life, by the Catholic Church, and by other people. You know, they, they, they torn away so much from me, and that man brought it back. And now, I, now that I learned how to control my emotions, my feelings, and writing songs about our culture, it just bring, brings back the freedom that I lost when I was five years old. It's sort of like came back. Not everything, <laughs> not everything, mind you, but at least that came back and gave me a chance to walk and try to find out my history. Even the, to this day, I don't even know much about my history. There's an Eskimo named Johnny who lived in the city, but he was born in the wild. He came to the city to live for a while, and now he wanted to go back home, back in the wild. He didn't like the street lights. Cars. He didn't like the highways and the buildings that were stalled. He wanted to go back home, back in the wild. Oh, how he wanted to go back home, back in the wild. Oh, Johnny, you'll be home someday.
when, when Kevin, when Kevin uh, contacted uh, me, like, like I just got my new album out, uh, like, like the new CD called uh, Assume Attack, The Great Land. Eh? Like we, like, like uh, we, and like we recorded here in Vancouver Island, and and we were we were at home at the time, and then uh, my my singing partner was looking through the uh, internet, and and she said, "Hey, there's there's somebody looking for you here." I said, "Who's that?" This guy's name is Kevin Kevin House, and I said, uh, "What does he want?" Oh, he wants to talk to you and interview you about music. Ah, hell with him. You know, it's probably, probably BS or something. You know, like it's not worth it. You know, so I just don't forget it. You know, like we went through so much in music, and eh? like a lot of it was, wasn't even true. Like, like didn't speak honestly, didn't put us where we wanted to go. And then, and then, and then, uh, two or three days later, uh, two or three days later. You know, uh, there he is again. You know, uh, and and I asked Linda, I asked Linda, why don't you uh, call him? See, call him, just call him, see what he says. You know, and you know, so Linda called him and said, "Is this Kevin?" You know, Kevin. And I think Linda asked him, uh, "Yeah, you were looking for Willie?" He said, "Yeah, he's right here." You know, and then and then we start talking on the phone. He said, "Willie." It's such an honor to meet you. I got your album, and I got a new project that's happening right now, and uh, and and we, we would like you to get involved, you know, and and then I uh, would like to get more. Uh, if it's okay with you, we would like to meet you and talk about this, you know, and uh, and uh, we'll see where we could take it from there. And so uh, I told I told uh, Kevin, okay, and then Kevin and a friend came to. Came to Vancouver Island and uh, he interviewed us for three days. So, yeah, maybe there is something there. You know, maybe there is something there. This work is time sensitive. We're all getting older, and you know, we're losing these artists. And while we have them with us, for the ones that we're lucky enough to still have with us, you know, it's nice to reach out to them, even just to thank them for their music. You know, like it's nice to. Uh, to connect with these people and let them know that their work resonated in, in ways that maybe they didn't even realize or understand. You know, I found a Willie Dunn record at a flea market, you know, in Vancouver. And it was recorded in Montreal in like 1971. And it's just like the music travels and it gets out there. And you hear stories from musicians and yeah, in regards to the artists on Native North America you hear a story from Willie Mitchell about go, getting shot in the head by a police officer when he was a teenager and how it, that in turn was a, a catalyst, a spark for his music career. You know, it, the music is one thing, but the stories behind it can just give so much more like meaning behind it all and can turn into this like almost another reality. You know, artists from the past are turning off the back of reissues like like Willie Thrasher, he's he's just returned from performing in Yellowknife, you know. And due to the the interest in the Native North America project, you know, it's incredible to think, you know, if you would have asked me like ten years ago when I first found Willie's Spirit Child album, you know, if I could foresee me one even knowing him and uh, being in Yellowknife, watching him perform on stage in front of a sold out crowd, 300 people in a theater, you know, I would have thought you were crazy, you know, <laughs> but it happened. <laughs> there, there, there was a lot of, uh, like, uh, like I used to be a heavy alcoholic and I used to be heavy in alcohol and drugs at the time and uh, I lost my relatives and friends. I lost uh, so many things in my life, and there's a lot of confusion, a lot of breakups. And uh, the, ever since the residential school, never left my uh, never left my spirit inside. You know, it's a lot of it, it took a lot of big effect of my life. You know, you know, like I said, like it was very close friends, very people that were very concerned that 
that love what I was doing, that knew where I came from, that knew where my spirit was, that knew deep down inside how much pain I was going through, that came, that came, came, came to me and uh, sort of like make me like a tame eagle, a tame wolf, a tame uh, polar bear, a tame spirit again, and let me know it's okay. A lot of us went through this. You don't have to suffer, Willie. You could walk through this and other people will learn from you. You don't have to suffer. You don't have to be an alcoholic, drug addict. And now, uh, and now I've, been, uh, I've been sober right now for about over 14 years. You know, I'm still traveling, you know, still writing music, you know. I still got my baby here, I still got my drums, you know, harmonica. Got my singing partner. I'll go on the road till whenever, you know, like the road for me will never end here. It'll, it'll never, it'll carry on to wherever I go. It'll always carry on. I still want to travel across Canada, the States, Europe, you know, and music will always be a big part of my life. I, I, I. the Lido in East Vancouver for a party, a party to celebrate the re-release of, of Willie's Spirit Child album that originally came out in 1981 via CBC. Uh, I feel really anxious and uh, I'm really glad that Gordon Dick, our friend, is here to open up for the show and, and we are representing uh, uh, like this album that was released by CBC in 81. You know, I remember being in Ottawa and I got called from Montreal by Elijah, Elijah, and he said, Willie, how would you like to release an, uh, an album? And that was the biggest moment of my life. And right now it's being released a second time, you know, because the first time it didn't have to push like we, 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 we had like the big stars do, but now that, now that it's gone all over the world, it reopened my heart and gave me a lot of encouragement to perform all over again. It's like when uh, it's, it's just like when you're like when you're uh, up in the hills, and uh, I remember 30 years ago I was a young wolf, and then I hear the big wolves howling, and they sound so beautiful. Then I want to learn how to howl like them as a young wolf. And then it's like being a songwriter, and then your howl of the wolves gets better as years and months go by, eh? and then finally you're up there howling with the moon, the northern lights, and people listening to you, God, that's a beautiful, beautiful howl. In the same way as I go with music today, I, I put it in, in the same category. And you keep playing music forever, eh? Yes, forever and ever and ever. Hey! This has been a long time since I did this song, remember? Six months ago, this album here, I didn't even know none of the words because it was 35 years ago I did this song. And then, and, and then, and, and then I told CBC, uh, like I, I, I told CBC what? Yeah, because, uh, because CBC didn't put it out the, the way it's supposed to put it out until Ken put it out again. Now, it's all over the world.
Cry of the wild is the only way 